Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm joined by Dr. Justin Barrett. He is Professor of Psychology at Fuller Graduate School of Psychology and Chief Project Developer for the Office for Science, Theology and Religion Initiatives at Fuller Theological Seminary. Professor Barrett is regarded as one of the founders of the cognitive science of religion field and is also the author of books like Why Would Anyone Believe in God? Cognitive Science, Religion and Theology, From Human Minds to Divine Minds, and Born Believers, The Science of Children's Religious Belief. So, Dr. Barrett, thank you a lot for taking the time to be on the show. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Okay, it's my pleasure. So, uh, let me just ask you first, when we're talking about the Cognitive Science of Religion, what would you say it brought to the table in terms of approaching the study of uh, religion from a scientific perspective and also perhaps what is it in, what is its importance for religious people well uh, the cognitive science of religion in some ways is following um, a general trend that we've seen in many academic subjects called the cognitive revolution. It started in psychology and linguistics and this cognitive revolution was the idea that uh, humans are not just a bundle of behaviors but what happens in our minds really matters uh, and we can study that scientifically. Uh, and first that kind of insight was applied to just sort of general human thought, memory, uh, how we reason, how we form new concepts, an area that came to be called cognitive psychology. But it also got applied to cultural forms of expression like language. Most famously Noam Chomsky advanced this idea that there's some kind of naturalness to language acquisition, that human minds are designed in such a way that it makes learning these natural languages really easy but not any kind of communication system is just as good as any others human minds are sort of crafted by natural selection to be really good at acquiring these languages that you know you and I speak but not things like binary code that our computers speak um, we'll take that general idea and apply it to religious phenomena we see belief in gods all over the world, across cultures, we see ritualized behaviors, we see beliefs in afterlives. Uh, they vary, sure, across cultures, but they keep coming back over and over again, a little bit like language. And so then we might think, well, then what are the cognitive foundations? What are the foundations in human minds that help account for why it is that humans are, seem to be attracted to these ideas, a little bit like how they're attracted to natural language? So then the cognitive science of religion has been an attempt to study religion in a scientific causal way generating hypotheses that can be tested based on this general insight that human minds ordinary human minds doing growing up in ordinary human environments seem to sort of make them receptive to religious ideas well if that's right why is that how does that work um, what are the cognitive mechanisms that make that possible Right. And when you refer there to the cognitive revolution, just to make it clearer for the audience, you were referring to that revolution that happened uh, scientifically uh, at, in around the 60s, right, where it really went against the previous tide that was the one of behaviorism that was added by people like John B. Watts and B. F. Skinner and so on that really were trying to reduce psychology and cognition uh, and cognitive science in general just to the behavior that people exhibited and they don't really cared about uh, aspects that were related to uh, people's minds and what happened inside their brains and things like that, correct? Correct. From the 1920s until, really until the 1960s, um, the study of human thought and behavior was dominated by this view called behaviorism. And it 
reduced human psychology to uh, learning, uh, basically, basic learning mechanisms of association, rewards and punishments, and that kind of thing. And what happened in the mind didn't matter. It was com regarded as completely irrelevant. So there really wasn't any cognitive psychology until the 1960s. There wasn't any cognitive science until what was discovered in the 1950s and 60s was, well, it's not the case that humans just can learn any associations equally well or any behaviors equally well. It seems that part of human nature, if you will, is to make some kinds of learning easier than others. We seem to be prepared in certain ways. And we also have very predictable limitations on some of the things we can do. Like we can only pay attention to so many pieces of information at a time and hold them in memory. These kinds of observations launched what is known now as the, as the cognitive revolution in psychology. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when it comes to studying religion from a scientific perspective, what are perhaps the main aspects of it that science can really tackle or is suited to tackle? Because I would imagine that perhaps some parts of it are really outside of the grasp of science, like, for example, uh, systems of moral values and things like that. Or, or at least we can also approach morality from a scientific perspective, but we can't really determine that a set of moral values is true or false, at least empirically. Right. That's right. Uh, the cognitive science of religion and all cognitive approaches to the study of culture, when done properly, it seems to me, uh, leave aside things like uh, whether some moral beliefs are true or false, whether there really are moral truths out there, and we leave aside whether or not there really are gods or ghosts or spirits or ancestors. We're not trying to gather evidence for the afterlife or evidence for a soul. We're not doing that. What we're trying to account for is why do people tend to believe that there's a soul or an afterlife or a god? Um, what are the cognitive mechanisms that make that possible or make that likely even? Or And in some cases, then why don't some people believe? So it's really the focus is on belief mechanisms, um, the formation of I religious ideas, and then how do those religious ideas motivate religious behaviors? What are the consequences of engaging in religious behaviors like rituals and prayer? So it's really studying the human side of it, if you will, not the metaphysical side of it. So we're not trying to gather evidence for God's existence. We're trying to gather evidence for why it is that people think God exists. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter that much, at least for the cognitive science of religion, to determine if there are uh, metaphysical entities like a god or several gods or even ghosts and other supernatural beings, but really, <clears throat> if people believe in them and why, and also the effects that those beliefs have on people's minds and people's behavior, is that it? That's correct, yeah. So we uh, generally operate using what's called methodological naturalism. Okay, so we try as far as possible to leave aside those types of claims. Are there really ancestors who are really acting? Do the rituals really, you know, bring the rain or increase people's fertility? Well, that's going to be contentious. That's going to divide us. Um, let's leave those aside for the moment and see how far we can get in explaining the persistence of beliefs and practices without references to those, uh, whether those realities or, or, or falsehoods, uh, depending on how you look at it. It may sp seem strange, um, but for those of us who've studied the way that minds work, we're perfectly happy to say, well, there's, there's a really interesting kind of cognitive story to be told about, maybe even why it, right now I feel like I'm talking to somebody. And I'm not denying that I'm talking to somebody, <laughs> but just that I am doesn't explain why I think that I am. Because there's still something to be said about, well, how is it that, uh, you know, my cognitive systems process certain kinds of visual information or auditory information to form percepts, you know, these, these things we perceive, form those into concepts, 
things that we think about and believe and in the systems of concepts. Um, how, why is it that I'm attributing to you consciousness, ideas, thoughts, desires? All of that is still an interesting process, regardless of whether or not you know I'm committed to you actually having a mind and actually talking to me right now. Right. Okay, so let me just ask you now, since we're talking about beliefs, what are beliefs really? What, are, what is the definition of it? Because, I mean, when we talk about beliefs, are we simply referring to a, any sort of mental representation that people make, either of real things or imaginary ones? Or are we focusing on mental representations that have some sort of causal relationship with behavior? Well, you, uh, you said that very well. <laughs> I think that's right. Uh, you know, the idea of a belief, philosophers will, you know, write an entire book about this and tell you about 20 different beliefs and belief-like states, uh, attitudes, impressions, uh, percepts. There are all of these kinds of mental states that seem a little bit like beliefs. In At least as I approach cognitive science of religion, I use the term belief in a little bit more of a common sense folk kind of way in that it's some kind of a mental representation that um, that predicts or promotes some kind of a behavior, right? So when we say we believe something, it's not just that we entertain the idea in our heads, but that we are inclined to act on that in some way in the real world, that it changes our behaviors in some respect. Sometimes that's only our verbal behaviors, us saying, oh yeah, I do believe that, I affirm it. Usually we want a little bit more evidence than that, right? We don't trust people who say they believe something and the only way we know that they do is they said they do. <laughs> that sounds like somebody's trying to fool us. Right. And I guess that's a very important aspect here because, I mean, people could say, or at least some of them, oh, I believe in God. But in fact, perhaps that sort of idea that they have could have zero effect in terms of uh, perhaps directing, uh, directing their behavior. Correct. That's right. And and we could even start looking at, well, what do they mean by saying they believe in God? They may have a, when they are, are saying that, they may have a concept of God in mind that's actually slightly different than the concept of God that they have that actually motivates behavior. So some of my earliest work in the cognitive science of religion was, you know, with Frank Kyle and other collaborators was just on that point, that lots of people say, oh, I believe in God, and I believe God has certain kinds of very fancy properties like being everywhere all at the same time and being able to act everywhere all at the same time and pay attention to everything at the same time. God can listen to billions of prayers simultaneously and act on them. And I'm not doubting that people sincerely believe that, but a, a further question is, yes, but does that motivate their behavior? Um, when they're not just answering a questionnaire or having sort of high-level discourse in the way we are, what concept of God motivates their action? And it might turn out, and our studies suggest that in many cases it turns out that it's, it's actually a lot more human-like concept of God. Um, so I can really only entertain in my head that God does one thing at a time, a lot like a human. As if he's paying attention to my prayer right now, I don't simultaneously think he's paying attention to your prayer. It's, it's kind of, he's focused on me, and it, it's all about me in this moment, <laughs> or something like that, right? Um, so merely uh, tapping people's beliefs in terms of what they say they think might give us a, a, a partial or impoverished picture of what's really going on cognitively when people are engaged in religious thought. Okay, so later I'm going to ask you about the developmental aspects of the cognitive science of religion, which I find really, really interesting, particularly when related to child development. But before we get into that, what are the main aspects of cognition that play a role in religion and religious thinking, in humans, of course? Right. Well, you might think of it as there are sort of two big groups of cognitive mechanisms that are important for religious thought. One group 
um, we could say are domain general cognitive processes. And what I have in mind here, uh, domain general just refers to, they apply across lots of different content areas. Language is a domain general kind of cognitive capacity. We can talk about all kinds of different things, not just one sort of thing with our language. We can talk about lots of things, so it's domain general in that respect. But here I have in mind particularly those um, domain general cognitive capacities of humans that enable cultural ideas to spread. So, um, and there are a number that humans seem to have that other species don't have. Like you and I can jointly attend to the same thing. So it's called joint attention. It's part of our theory of mind apparatus, as it's sometimes called theory of mind, just referring to um, how is it that I understand that you have a mind with beliefs, desires, conscious experiences that motivate your actions. Um, how do I think about how you think about my thoughts? And I think about how you're thinking about my thoughts. That's really advanced theory of mind. But joint attention is part of that. You and I both recognize we're paying attention to the same thing. That seems to be a key feature in teaching, learning from each other, passing ideas on. It also seems to be a key feature in religious systems because we don't think of religions as just what I do all by myself. That's just weird. That's just me. That's not, that's not a cultural system. For something to be cultural, it needs to spread. It needs to be shared. I need to know that you, as a member of my group, are worshiping the same God that I am right. because then I can learn from you about that same God. Well, that requires a certain theory of mind or joint attention. So that's one really important domain general kind of learning capacity. We need to be able to communicate ideas to each other and so forth. So there's this domain general bucket. Then there's this domain specific bucket of, <laughs> or a, a package of cognitive capacities that have attracted most of the attention in cognitive science of religion. They're trying to, it, when we look at those, we're trying to say, well, not just why does any cultural information spread, but why this particular kind of cultural information that looks religious, okay? And their attention has focused on things like, uh, it appears that we've got a natural tendency toward um, uh, thinking of the world in what's sometimes called teleofunctional terms, Okay, it's a big fancy term that really just means we see design and purpose in the world around us. Um, I have in mind here Deborah Kellerman's work um, that she's done with both children and adults that suggests that humans naturally are predisposed to look around the world when they see a mountain or a river or an animal, they think it has the features it does or maybe it's even here for particular purposes. Uh, ferns grow in the forest in order to shade the forest floor which, strictly speaking, from a scientific perspective, we might reject. No, that's not why ferns grow in the forest. They do shade the forest floor, but that's not why they're there. But Kellerman has used developmental and experimental studies to pretty convincingly demonstrate that when we're not careful, <laughs> when we're just sort of thinking intuitively, it looks like we approach the world through this teleological stance. We see design and purpose. How does that matter? Well, it seems like that would make us really receptive to the idea that then someone is behind that purpose, or maybe lots of someones. It need not be one someone. And she actually has some pretty interesting data, both from believers and non-believers. So atheists even seem to show these tendencies across cultural groups. Um, so that's one domain-specific type of thing. It applies only to the natural world kind of thinking, and it looks like we see design and purpose. A second kind of cognitive mechanism that's received attention is what I've called the agency detection device. Um, that was really an idea inspired by Stuart Guthrie's work on anthropomorphism. So Guthrie uh, proposed that uh, across cultures, humans have this natural tendency to see human-like beings or action in the world around them. Uh, Guthrie is a, as an anthropologist and he backed up this claim with lots of different kinds of evidence, not just in religious domains, but in, across lots of areas. So the, for him, this is a general cognitive capacity. We're on the lookout for human-like beings and activity. 
I translated that into this agency detection device um, because there was experimental evidence from the cognitive sciences that we've got something like that system in our heads that helps us tell the difference even from infancy between objects that move themselves in goal-directed ways and the mere furniture of the world, if you will, brute objects. So agency detection seems to be important. Why? Well, if we don't at least occasionally in a community detect that the gods are acting, it would be hard to continue believing in them. Um, Guthrie's point is actually there's lots of evidence that the gods are acting if we allow ourselves to see it. Um, now, he's not making a claim that the gods are real. Let me be clear about that. He's just saying that our system, probably for evolutionary reasons, um, is pretty generous. It's pretty forgiving. It will detect signs of agency even when uh, the evidence is a little thin or ambiguous. So that's the agency detection device. So we've got teleological reasoning. We've got agency detection. Both of those seem to be uh, related to the theory of mind system that I already mentioned. For me to have a relationship with a god, to worship a god, to do rituals for a god, I have to be able to generate ideas about what's the god thinking, what does it want from me, can I make it happy, can I make it like me, can I make it do things for me um, through certain actions. All of that is this theory of mind work. Fortunately, that develops in children, you know, uh, across cultures it looks like by the time kids are six or seven. All of the basics are in place for theory of mind reasoning, unless they've got a developmental uh, pathology, like something on the autism spectrum. So that's another mechanism that's received attention. Mm -hmm. um, it also seems to be the case that um, humans are what's sometimes been called uh, intuitive dualists, okay? And that term is referring to the idea that minds and bodies are somehow separable, or at least that there are there's more to us than our bodies. Sometimes it's not just that there's a mind in a body, but maybe there's a mind, a spirit in a body, or a mind, a soul in a body. Or, but anyway, that the body isn't all there is to us. Um, Paul Bloom and Jesse Baring and others have produced evidence um, suggesting that actually, just because our our cognitive system that deals with bodies is very different than our theory of mind system. It's got different input conditions, it's got different output conditions, it looks like it's got a different evolutionary kind of history behind it. For these reasons, they actually don't fit together all that well all the time. And so, we really do have the impression that, well, it's me inside my body, and I control my body. I'm not just my body, there's, there's a me in there too. Why is that important? Well, this idea of a of uh, an enduring part of myself that might last across death, that might have existed before this body, um, that might be reincarnated, uh, uh, or whatever it is, or resurrected in the new heavens and earth, whatever it is, right? That idea is a cross-culturally recurrent kind of notion that seems to have deep anchors in just how human cognition is put together. So those, those are a few examples of the kinds of domain-specific cognition that cognitive scientists of religion have been pointing to as kind of the, the hooks that religious beliefs hang on. Right. So let me just ask you about this, because I've already had on the show Dr. David C. Geary, and we talked about uh, what we could call perhaps folk knowledge or what some people call core knowledge that is right. subdivided into three big aspects, right? Folk physics or the way we are innately predisposed to approach the world around us, folk biology, that is how we tend to classify plant and animal species and attribute an essence to them, that, that is really important here. And also, uh, as you already alluded to, uh, theory of mind or folk psychology and the ways we think about our own minds and the minds of other people and also at the social level. So the, those are also things that are very important here, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. And in fact, I won't, since you're already familiar with these folk psychology, folk physics, folk biology, that teleological reasoning, that appears to be part of folk biology. 
um, but it gets used even to mountains and rivers under certain conditions. Um, uh, th the theory of mind, yes, that's part of folk psychology, and that tension between the folk psychology and the fo folk physics is often what's regarded as the thing that drives this intuitive sense of dualism, that minds and bodies are different kinds of things. So well said, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the intuitions we have from folk biology are also behind religious expressions like uh, animism, right? That's good, yes. So we might think of animism as radiating from this folk biology, or at least having an intuitive feel. Also, you mentioned um, uh, essentialism. So that would um, be the notion that uh, different groups of animals, or maybe even in some cases people, have an unseen essence that somehow um, gives rise to the properties that we see. Um, that kind of essentialist reasoning, while maybe its its native domain is thinking of animal species or plant species, um, it appears that we can apply this kind of essentialist thinking also to human groups and even maybe special people within our groups. So you might think of holy people as having a different essence, for instance. Um, another bit from folk biology that seems to come up in religious thought is the idea of contagion. Okay, so it seems that from folk biology we have the notion, this sort of um, uh, inchoate notion of contagion that certain types of things can infect other types of things by either proximity or physical touch. They're unseen things. So germs, for instance, are, uh, uh, you know, viruses and bacteria is what we say today, but we used to say germs, and before, but even before there was germ theory, there was this sort of notion that if somebody's really sick, you've got to stay away from them or you could get infected. But it not only works negatively, making people sick, it can work positively. So holy people or holy objects, all you need to do is touch them or be near them and you might get positive stuff from them. And so then we see in lots of churches, for instance, um, in Roman Catholic churches or Eastern Orthodox churches, there are relics from the saints in like, for instance, in the altar. Um, and it blesses the entire space, apparently through something that looks a lot like this contagion mechanism. So all of this to say, it appears we have these little cognitive mechanisms that are motivational, um, that give us uh, particular ways of thinking and feeling that then the cultural system builds upon. Uh, they give foundation to the cultural building and they make some forms of cultural expression more likely than others. In the jargon of the field, we sometimes say cognition informs and constrains cultural expression. Um, it's too, it's, it's kind of hard to move too far away from those, that folk thinking. Uh, you need special conditions to do that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this sort of essentialism that comes from folk biology and also perhaps combining with theory of mind and the ways we think about our own minds and the minds of other people, these are the things that uh, bring about our belief or our perhaps our innate tendency to believe in a human soul or something that is part of the human condition that perhaps will survive the death of our physical body and also things related to believing in life after death and reincarnation and things like that, correct? That is correct. So that even though that notion of essentialism may have developed uh, to help us think about different types of animals and plants, we also use it to think about individual people, it appears. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a long, age-old philosophical problem of, of how to track identity of a single individual. And in some ways, contemporary science has made that even more difficult when we know that something like, what, did, what do they say, about every seven years, all of our matter gets changed out. So then, was the person who said he was Justin Barrett, professor of psychology, seven years ago, the same guy who's talking to you now, well, that's an interesting conceptual problem, actually, um, especially if you go back more than seven years and I didn't even look the same and maybe had hair and things like that. <laughs> um, 
but it appears that one way we intuitively solve the problem is, no, there's this underlying essence that's my essence, that the physical stuff somehow is caused by that essence, that hidden essence. Um, and you're right, that starts sounding an awful lot like a soul that a lot of cultural systems have developed, that sort of essential me that could be, uh, you know, reincarnated in some other form, or it could have an afterlife uh, after this one, after death. So I think you've got that right. At least that's our leading theory at the moment. Uh, but these are contentious issues, right? And lots of science to be had here. Oh, yes, of course, of <laughs> course. <laughs> so, I mean, all of these things that we've been talking about, like the agency detection device, like core knowledge and things like that, I think these are, uh, have already been studied as human universals. That is, they occur cross-culturally, right? But uh, at least some of these cognitive mechanisms, let's say, we, ca we also find them in very early stages of child development, correct? That's correct. Um, and it, I guess if we're seeing it across cultures and it looks like they have not it, it haven't grown up in relation to each other, we ought to think, well, maybe we see these in early childhood. Things like agency detection, we see that in other species, right? Um, the beginnings of theory of mind we see in, uh, certainly in our nearest uh, primate relatives, right, in bonobos and chimpanzees. But yes, uh, you know, I mentioned that this teleofunctional reasoning that Deb Kellerman has so carefully researched, uh, you know, she started researching this in early childhood, preschool years, and looking at the kinds of explanations that children give for things in the natural world. Why are the rocks pointy? So she show a picture of pointy rocks and ask children just open-ended questions like why, why are the rocks pointy? And she found that kids would say things like, well, so animals won't sit on them and smash them. You know, they, so they give a function instead of a mechanistic explanation to that. And she followed up with, you know, more experimental types of things where they compare, for instance, uh, well, what do kids say when an adult says, well, actually, I think it's because bits of stuff piled up over time. You know, that's why it's pointy. But, you know, this other adult says it's so that animals won't sit on it and smash it. Well, who do you think is right? Uh, and children tend to like these teleological or purpose-based kinds of, of answers. So Kellerman has studied that in early, develop, early childhood development. I've looked at um, how do children reason about God concepts and other supernatural agent concepts in early childhood? Where do those concepts come from? How do they develop? Um, mostly using variations of um, theory of mind tasks. So a really famous theory of mind task is called the false belief task. And here you uh, present children with uh, the classic, one of the classic versions is you present children with a familiar container, um, something they know, they should know what's inside of it. Maybe it even has pictures of the contents on the inside. Um, in the first studies with Americans, we used uh, a cracker box. Uh, so it showed a picture of crackers, um, showed the children the box and say, you know, what do you think is inside the box? They say crackers because they can see it's a cracker box. And then we show that we took the crackers out and we put rocks inside the box. Or it could be anything else that's surprising. Close the box back up so that they can't see the rocks, but they know there are rocks in there now. And make sure they know. So what's in the box? Rocks. That's right. There are rocks in the box. Now, if your mom came in and she saw this closed box for the first time, what would she think is inside the box? And the classic kind of developmental finding is that three-year-olds say rocks. Mom would think there are rocks in the box. Even though it's a cracker box, they don't seem to understand that mom would be fooled by the appearance of the container. So mom would have, they don't understand mom would have a false belief. But by the time children are about five or six, the vast majority get it. They'd say, no, no, mom would think that there are crackers in the box. She would have a false belief. And for philosophical reasons, it's been argued that understanding that a belief can be false is a real key to understanding what a belief is at all. It's not just a mental representation. It's a mental representation that could be false or it could be true. 
but it's true or false is not what makes it a belief, right? Um, so that had been done a lot, and I found that a really kind of fun finding, especially because um, the traditional view about God concepts was that all God is to, especially these young children, three, four, five, six-year-olds, is that God's just a human being because all they can do is think about human beings. There's that old idea of anthropomorphism again, but this time going back to Piaget and to Freud. And uh, so I thought, well, then let's find out what children say about God in these tasks. So would they treat God exactly the same way as their mom until they're about seven or eight years old? And it turns out the answer is no, they don't have to. Now, some kids will. Some, some will. They may not know that God is marking out a special kind of being. They may just think God is the name of somebody they met, you know, down in the market or something. <laughs> but what we found in the original studies and has been replicated since is that when asked about God using this kind of test, then three-year-olds would say, yeah, God would think they're rocks in the box. And they think mom would think they're rocks in the box. But then your older kids those old five-year-olds <laughs> would <laughs> recognize that mom would think she would be fooled. She'd have a false belief and think they're crackers in the box. But they still say God would think they're rocks in the box, at least in a lot of the studies. Um, so what it looks like is um, children, in, in a sense, have to learn that mom would get things wrong and when she's going to get things wrong. But a, a super knowing being like God, in some ways, is conceptually simpler. Because you don't have to keep track of when they know things and when they don't. You just assume that they know. Mm -hmm. Now, those studies, those early studies using that false belief task, have been criticized as maybe overestimating how much knowledge kids automatically attribute to others. Because the kid knew that there were rocks in the box. And so maybe they were overwhelmed by their own impression. But, but there are rocks in the box. Right. So, so what was developed was an ignorance task um, where the kids don't know what's in the box. It's a plain container, uh, unmarked. Now they don't know what's in it. They have no reason to think they're crackers. Um, and you don't even show them what's inside of it. You just say, here's a box. Do you know what's inside of it? No. Would your mom know what's inside of it? Would God know what's inside of it? Um, interestingly, across cultures now, uh, Brad Wigger and Emma Burdett and I are working on a, a, the empirical write-up for a paper that shows results from that task in four different cultures, Dominican Republic, Kenya, Israel, and uh, Great Britain. In all four cases, children are more inclined to attribute knowledge to God than they are to their parents. Mm -hmm. Across the board, the general pattern is that children actually are more accurate in reasoning about God than mom or a friend, another human being. That is to say, it still looks like it's more of a developmental achievement to get to understand when it is that mom knows things and when she doesn't versus God's sort of super knowingness. That's a little bit easier, just assume. Um, there are some interesting cross-cultural variations, you know, across the tasks, but there is a general pattern that seems to be underlying it anyway. So that's one so, example of the kind of developmental work that we've been doing. Right. So this is very interesting because, I mean, there are lots of people, and perhaps particularly the atheists, that say, uh, that um, I mean that children have to be to be indoctrinated into religion and they only believe in God perhaps because their parents or their community uh, infuse them with that belief and impose them that but it seems then that through those sorts of experiments that children very naturally and perhaps spontaneously develop a sort of belief in God, or at least some sort of supernatural being. Yeah, the way I like to put it is, I agree that that, that view that children will only believe if they're sort of thoroughly indoctrinated and maybe even frightened into believing these religious things, you know, you'll be punished if you don't. I think that's just a false story. It's 
it's really it doesn't match up with the evidence. There are plenty of kids who seem to go beyond their parents' beliefs, um, and not just about gods, but uh, Jesse Baring, for instance, has produced some evidence that children's beliefs in the afterlife are actually stronger in earlier childhood than in later childhood. So they actually come down, they don't go up. And also beliefs in a pre-life, which is something we don't talk about because in a lot of cultures we don't talk about pre-life, but in some cultures pre-lifes are a thing. Well, again, children look like they have stronger beliefs in a pre-life and it comes down. Um, so th that indoctrination explanation is inadequate in the face of the evidence. But the way I like to think about it is that our early developing cognitive systems create something like um, conceptual spaces right. um, that then get filled in by cultural inputs. But that cultural input has to fit the space well or it's unlikely for children to learn it and believe it because of teleological reasoning, because of the way that our theory of mind seems to bias us towards uh, super knowing beings, um, maybe even immort immortality seems to actually be an easy concept for children. They have to learn that people are going to die. For these kinds of reasons, it looks like there's a conceptual space that's kind of shaped a little bit like a god. And so then if the cultural environment provides an adequate god, the kids go, oh yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. And we're talking about three-year-olds. They go, okay, god, got it. They don't need to be sort of thoroughly indoctrinated. What they would need to be thoroughly indoctrinated into is some kind of god that doesn't fit those conceptual parameters. Um, maybe some kind of formless ground of all being that is an uh, eight-dimensional kind of being that experiences time backwards or, or something really, you know, science fiction-y like that. Well, that would take indoctrination because it just doesn't fit the natural conceptual space. But the kinds of gods that are really successful and spread across cultures, it looks like they spread for good reason. They kind of fit the way our minds work. Mm -hmm. So, since we, we've been talking about uh, domain-specific cognitive mechanisms and also domain-general ones, I mean, these sorts of uh, cognitive mechanisms, they are themselves adaptations, right? So, th does that mean that if we need all of these cognitive ingredients to give rise to religion, that the theory or hypothesis of religion as a byproduct is the one that has the most scientific support or not? <laughs> You're asking me to take sides in a, in a fight here. Um, it, there's one respect in which the byproduct kind of approach strikes me as exactly right. Um, so uh, religious beliefs seem to be appropriately described as a byproduct of ordinary human cognitive systems. But that's leaving quiet, that's not saying anything about evolutionary theory at that point. It's just saying that we've got cognitive mechanisms that do more than deal with gods or rituals or afterlifes or souls. And they give, but these mechanisms do seem to support or encourage those kinds of what we might call religious beliefs. So they don't just do that, but they do that. All right. So in that sense, a byproduct. But then there's this other debate going on, which is, well, yeah, but our, sometimes put this way, is religion an evolutionary byproduct? Not just a cognitive byproduct, but an evolutionary byproduct. Or is it an adaptation? Right. And I'd want to make a couple of observations there. First of all, the question is ill-formed. <laughs> um, it's not a good question. And the reason it's not a good question is religion isn't a thing. Okay, there's no such thing, religion, mm. that could be a byproduct or an adaptation. Really, the question should be something more on the order of our, uh, our ancestor concepts, belief in ancestors, and right. the behaviors that go along with those, are those a byproduct, an evolutionary byproduct, or are they an evolutionary adaptation? Um, this religion thing, that's, that's too broad, it's got fuzzy boundaries, There's no, it's not a thing, okay? Whereas maybe we could say, all right, well, what about these ancestor 
ancestor worship kinds of practices and beliefs. Or belief in a cosmic creator deity. Okay. Or ritualized behaviors. So, are those byproduct or are they evolutionary adaptations? And then I think, well, there's probably, it's probably going to differ depending on which part of religion you're talking about. Um, um, because those are going to have different causal pathways and they're going to have different um, fitness consequences on those who engage in them, right? So that's to say, I, I, I am kind of dodging your question. <laughs> I'm saying yes to cognitive byproduct, but I'm going to remain agnostic with regard to evolutionary byproduct because it really depends on which particular bit we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the propensity toward belief in some kind of supernatural, unseen agents like ghosts, gods, spirits, uh, the ancestors, those kinds of ideas, it sure doesn't look like those are adaptations. It looks like they arose as these cognitive byproducts. But I'm completely open to the idea that once they arose, they may have contributed to the fitness of the people who believed in them and acted upon those beliefs. And that's one of the, you know, the evolutionary study of religion has been looking at that. Is it the case that if I think um, that there is a morally interested God around then that'll make me behave better and that'll help build cooperative societies. Well, maybe. Um, or maybe it's the case that we need uh, need religious rituals maybe helps bond communities together in important ways, building trust because of the ritual performance. But it, these rituals could have been motivated by, you know, by football or, <laughs> or something else. Right. But they happen to be motivated by religious beliefs, and that worked. And so the religious beliefs sort of then are free riders on the ritualized practices. Who knows? I mean, there are lots. It depends on the particular bit of religion you're looking at, I think. And I think it's just too early. I don't think any the evidence is absolutely compelling for either the evolutionary byproduct or the evolutionary adaptation uh, interpretation at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, so ask me ten years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I will probably do that if I if I'm still running the show by then. Okay, so so uh, let me just ask you then, uh, in regards to what you've just said, do you think that from an evolutionary perspective, it would be scientifically plausible to approach religion as perhaps an adaptation in the sense of? if we talk about it as a set of uh, behaviors that are culturally transmitted and that uh, allow for us to increase our personal and inclusive fitness in terms of being more successful in terms of survival and reproduction. And I'm not sure if you, if you would like to tackle the issue about group selection here or not, because that's another contentious topic. So, uh. So, uh, make sure I'm getting this right. So, you're asking me, um, no, could you ask the question again? Sorry. Uh, yes, I, I, perhaps just to rephrase it, I guess that I was asking if it would be scientifically plausible to talk about religion if uh, as an adaptation, if it was a set of behaviors that was culturally transmitted and that the people who adopted them increased their uh, inclusive or personal fitness uh, through them, let's say. Right. Uh, so we might imagine then that there is a particular set of uh, God beliefs, afterlife beliefs, ritualized behaviors that uh, for some reason tend to go together. And once they sort of have been clustered together for some reason, they then have some kind of a, a fitness benefit, either on the individual or the group level, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, right. That strikes me as a reasonable question to explore. I have not yet seen anyone specify um, these cultural, these clusters of cultural traits in that way. Um, 
Because really then that would amount to saying, well, is there something adaptive about uh, Hinduism? Mm -hmm. uh, and I haven't seen anybody get that specific. Uh, and the reason why I'm suggesting Hinduism or Buddhism or Christianity or Islam, whichever you like, uh, or something else, um, mm -hmm. ancestor cults, is you would need to get down to the level of, well, why this cluster and how are they contributing to fitness as opposed to another cluster that could have arisen? Uh, I haven't seen that yet. There's been this sort of general assumption that, oh, but there's enough similarities across these different religions. Well, I'm not sure that's right. I think that's an assumption that, that predates this new cognitive and evolutionary study of religion. And I think we ought to be very careful about just sort of importing those assumptions. Um, you know, this, even this term religion, right, it has a cultural history to it. Uh, 600 years ago, it didn't exist. And now we use it like we know what we're talking about. Um, so we need to be really careful with that. It, it would be a little bit like saying, oh, well, art is adaptive, is an adaptation. I'm like, well, well, wait a minute, what do you mean by art? Art is actually kind of a, a new idea. Um, and so we really need to unpack those terms, I think, before we can have a, a well-targeted and theoretically motivated research program in these areas. So I guess to, that was a long answer to your question. Yes, it could be scientifically responsible under certain conditions, but I haven't seen anybody sort of pushing those conditions actually yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now shifting gears a little bit, I think that it is important also in this conversation to establish a distinction between what we could call natural religion on the one hand and theology on the other, or perhaps religion as a product of natural selection and also our natural cognitive proclivities and uh, organized and institutionalized religion, let's say. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of terms here that often overlap. Uh, I think there are, and you've pointed to, I think, two different distinctions, and they're both good ones. One is the difference between what you might think of as this intuitive or natural religion, um, the religion that people have maybe um, that they don't think about very much, that motivates behaviors, that uh, when they're not sort of being careful, monitoring what they're thinking about, that just animates them and uh, moves them. So um, there's, there's that. It's going to be closer to those uh, natural anchor points that we've been talking about, those foundations at folk psychology, physics, biology, essentialism, all of those different things, we would expect natural religion to be a little closer to those because it seems like it takes the more reflective work to move your religious thought and practice away from that. Um, Bob McCauley, uh, Robert McCauley, a philosopher of of uh, cognitive science, but also a cognitive scientist of religion has talked about the cultural scaffolding that's required to move these really natural, uh, basic kinds of religious ideas away into something more complex, sophisticated, or what uh, uh, Daniel Dennett has called domesticated religion, right? <laughs> um, so that's an important distinction. Um, so I might as a natural religious concept, sort of maybe my concept of God, my natural concept of God might be that God really is a little bit more like a human. A human with special properties, for sure, knows a lot more, has more power, is immortal. But the idea that God is outside of space and time, mm -hmm. I believe that. I be that's part of my fancier, less natural concept of God. But that notion that God's outside of space and time doesn't do a lot of work for me. So, if you know, when I go to church, I don't think of God as outside of space and time. If I'm praying to God, I don't think, ah, but God's outside of space and time right now. And so God already heard this prayer or, wait a minute, that doesn't even make sense because outside of time, it couldn't be that God already, you know, ah, my brain is hurting. 
So even though I can affirm that doctrinally, it's not doing any real work. So that's one of the distinctions you were getting at, I think, between that natural religion and the, the fancier stuff that we develop under special cultural conditions in places like where I teach now at a seminary or, or in, you know, or in the monastery when we can sort of sit back and think and write things down and talk to each other about fancy ideas, which is already starting to get at that second distinction, which is between what you might think of as religion and then theology. I take theology to be the sort of intellectual reflections on religious thought and practice. Um, it's a trying to systemize it in a, uh, in a more intellectual kind of way. It's, in some ways, it's doing philosophy on the subject matter of, well, what's God like? What is it, what's human nature in relation to God? What does it mean to live a fulfilling, flourishing life? Those sort of big questions. That's what theologians do. And that's a very different kind of exercise. Back to Bob McCauley, he points out that in lots of forms of cultural expression, you can think of them as falling on a continuum of naturalness from this kind of stuff that almost doesn't require any kind of special cultural conditions or special kind of practice, and it's just going to crop up. And you might think of um, maybe belief in God is of some kind of God is on that end. It's very natural. It's like uh, dance or music or maybe even like language. And then you've got this sort of other end of the continuum where it takes a lot of effort and special conditions, uh, reflection, you know, like being really good at chess or really good at quantum mechanics, if anybody really gets that. I don't know. <laughs> um, so there's, there's that end of the continuum. And, and theology is probably sliding more in that direction. Um, and for that reason, then, when people start talking about, well, what's the relationship between science and religion? Unless they're talking about what we've been talking about, the scientific study of religion, probably what they should be asking is what's the relationship between science, the sciences, as reflective intellectual activities, and theology as a reflective intellectual activity. Um, because they're more of the same kind of thing. They're intellectual activities. They're, they're modes of inquiry. So how do those relate to each other versus... Uh, comparing science, which is this intellectual mode of inquiry, to religion, which is the sort of lived existence that used to be inseparable from human life. It was just how we did stuff. It'd be like saying, well, what's the relationship between science and morality? You know, just folk morality. And how people, you know, well, it's not quite the right question. Anyway, sorry, I got off your question a little bit. I rambled. That's because it was a really good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that usually happens when the questions are really deep and exploring very complicated topics like we're doing today. So and, anyway, just uh, perhaps a follow up to that. Uh, could we approach the question also about the difference between natural religion and theology by perhaps thinking about how certain types of rituals are done because I mean and thinking about uh, modes of rituals or modes of modes of religiosity that I think was were proposed by uh, RV Whitehouse right to Yep. To, to analyze the different sorts of rituals that we have, like the doctrinal ones and then the, the more sort of what he called uh, imagistic rituals that are the ones that have a deeper psychological impact on people, but, but, are, but they perform them more rarely, let's say, instead of uh, when in comparison with the doctrinal ones. So p perhaps the, uh, would that be a good approach to have here? Per because, I mean, perhaps the doctrinal ones are the ones where uh, priests tend to participate more and try to communicate things to people that are more difficult to assimilate and less uh, psychologically innate, let's say, something like that. Good, yeah. So what you're pointing to is that certain kinds of religious practices actually f uh, can be part of this cultural scaffolding for developing theological reflection and thought mm -hmm. and making religion a little bit less natural in some ways, right, to get it, right. uh, move it into the head. 
uh, good distinction. Um, so Harvey Whitehouse, in his Modes of Religiosity Theory, does distinguish between these two basic types of religious systems, one focused on these rarely performed, highly emotional, usually initiation types of rituals. Um, in fact, at one point he referred to them as rites of terror. Because young initiates, where he did his field work in Melanesia, it's common, you know, that your 13, 14, 15 year old boys get sort of kidnapped in the middle of the night and taken into the forest and they get beaten and they get stung by nettles and you know, their feet get burned by fires and they're made to eat really disgusting things. And and this can go on for weeks. And afterwards, then they've got new status in the society. And it's a religious ritual, but it, because it's motivated by belief in the ancestors and who we are as a people and so forth. So you might think of it as religious, but they're not being taught doctrine in a formal way, right? There's no sermon. Um, right. And in fact, White House has suggested and others have followed up on the idea that um, all of this emotional arousal that takes place in these rituals prompts one to think, well, this is really important in my life. I need to really reflect on this, but they're not given much by way of material to reflect on. Contrast that with religious systems in which the focal rituals are repeated over and over again, like the Catholic Mass, right. where you've got weekly or more frequently than weekly kind of similar routine that happens over and over again, that then provides a really nice vehicle for giving doctrine around that ritual or in the same space as that ritual. So you get sermons, you get reflections on what is the Mass about and why, and that over time, people can develop much more theological knowledge in those kinds of, of settings. So that's a great example of where um, the, the type of religious practice then can be a form of cultural scaffolding for the religious thought and can move then the, the natural religion to a, a more complex kind of uh, space. Mm -hmm. Okay, so ju just two last questions before we go. The first one, going back to child development and the, the sorts of psychological mechanisms that are proven as innate in humans. Uh, do you think that that would give a basis to what Calvin called the sensus divinitatis? Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Let me give you a, a preliminary clarification, and then I'll I'll answer the real question. Um, okay. So I try to avoid the term innate. Okay. Um, some of my colleagues are happy enough to use it. I I avoid it mostly because I think it it gives people the idea of something being present at birth, and these cognitive systems aren't necessarily at birth. Mm -hmm. But the kind of cognition I emphasize is the kind of cognition that Macaulay has called maturationally natural. Uh, and he uses that term in place of what people usually mean by innate. What he means by maturationally natural is that as a regular course of human development, just by virtue of being the kind of animals we are, growing up in the kind of environments we grow up in, you know, having a mother who is nursing us and you know, being in these social groups and so forth, but also being in a world that has animals and plants and gravity and <laughs> you know, things like that, we tend to quite automatically develop in a certain kind of way. Um, we'll call that maturationally natural or just natural cognition for short, as opposed to innate, because I'm not even sure what innate means at a certain point, right? Our, okay. Are my teeth innate? Well, they didn't. They weren't there at birth, but you know, they kind of come in inevitably. That kind of thing. So let's leave innateness aside and just say natural cognition by virtue of being humans in the kind of developmental environments that humans grow up in. Would you usually get? And what we usually get is this bundle of cognitive mechanisms or systems, whatever you want to call those propensities, that make it really easy to believe in something like a god. Or maybe multiple multiple gods. Uh, we don't know which which is the more natural path, whether it's one or a whole bunch. Um, 
There are some striking parallels between that idea and what has been developed in Christian theology, this notion of sensus divinitatis, or sense of the divine. Um, uh, it predates John Calvin, uh, but his is probably the most famous articulation of this. We see a similar idea, I guess, in St. Augustine, and really it's inspired by um, the letter to the Romans by St. Paul. In the first chapter of Romans, Paul makes this sort of suggestion that everybody all of humanity have this kind of vague notion of divinity, at least, and a vague notion of what's right and wrong. Um, and they're accountable to that. Well, that's a pretty bold claim. <laughs> John Calvin develops this into the sense of the divine, when, and for him that does mean uh, pretty much all over the world, just by virtue of being a human being, you've got some sense that there's something beyond humans out there, something more like a god. He does call it sensus divinitatis, not sensus dei. So he doesn't say a sense of God, full theology, baked into everybody. He says sense of divinitatis, something kind of generally divine in there. And one could easily say, well, yeah, and that's, I mean, it does look like cognitive science of religion is pointing in that direction. It does look like humans have this natural receptivity at least at least receptivity to the idea of there being some kind of other state of being out there that you might think of as divinity um, moral foundation theory the work of Jonathan Haidt and his colleagues seems to suggest that and we do seem to have common moral intuitions that are also cross-culturally recurrent um, so maybe Calvin was not wrong on this um, maybe some of the particulars need to be tuned down. Maybe the science can actually contribute to the theology in this regard. Because there are other theologians, other than John Calvin, who have slightly different versions of the sensus divinitatis. And I guess what I think could be kind of fun is if scientists actually looked at those differences and started to study. Uh, well, what is, does the evidence support one version of sensus divinitatis over another? Um, is the sensus divinitatis the kind of thing that everybody truly has, or can it be impaired by developmental pathology, for instance, uh, by sickness, by really unfortunate environmental conditions? Um, is it sort of generally churning out the idea of, oh, there's something else out there, I wonder what it is, or is it more specific than that? Does it really sort of focus us in on, no, no, there's a creator out there, and a creator who's probably good, I, you know, th these are open questions from the scientific standpoint. Um, does the sensus divinitatis get activated when we see a beautiful sunrise, or we climb to the top of a mountain and we see all of this nature around? Is that when the sensus divinitatis says, hey, there's a god? Or, <laughs> or is it sort of just generally active in the way that Deb Kellerman seems to think? That we don't have to climb to the top of a mountain to have these experiences, but just seeing nature makes us think there's maybe someone behind this. Mm -hmm. okay, Lots of questions. So... Lots of questions. <laughs> I'm giving you questions instead of answers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's what I get most of the time wh while I'm interviewing people that do scientific work. So <laughs> <laughs> that, that's normal, I think. So. For my last question, now I would like to, ta to talk about the opposite side of the barricade here, I think, and refer to the new atheists. Because, I mean, uh, I'm, I myself am an atheist and I love science, but it, it annoys me quite a bit the approach that the most prominent, at least, new atheists have or add to religion in terms of them trying to reduce it to sort of a, like Richard Dawkins called it, referring to memes, a mind virus that really predisposes people to bad behavior and bad beliefs about the world. And I mean, I think that there's something good about alerting people to uh, certain aspects 
of their belief systems that might render them uh, uh, gullible to certain ideas that might have some bad consequences, of course. But on the other hand, taking into account all of the things that we've been talking about today, it seems to me that religion, even from a purely scientific perspective, is much more complex than this approach that the new atheists tend to have to it, let's say. I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I don't think there is such a thing as religion. And so if someone says religion is bad for us, it's sort of an empty statement. So religion is good for us is kind of an empty statement. Uh, what do you mean by religion? Under what context is a particular behavior or thought or whatever cluster of behaviors and thoughts? When are those sort of good for us and when aren't they? When are they dangerous and when are they actually really beneficial? Um, so there's that. It's just, it's, it can be too simplified. Unfortunately, sometimes, unlike your interview, those in the media often will try to simplify things down and just, what's the headline? So that's, that's a danger. Um, and that said, you know, somebody could say, well, Barrett, you're being evasive. <laughs> um, <laughs> We know what we're talking about. We mean Islam, Christianity, these types of things. And and then I'd say, well, okay, fair enough. Well, then what does the science say? And actually, the preponderance of the science, at least, now, Islam hasn't been studied as carefully as Christianity has, mostly just because of where science has been done. The scientific study of religion, uh, psychology of religion, has mostly been done in Europe and North America, and so then there's been a focus primarily on, on Christian beliefs and practices. But the bulk of the evidence suggests that, you know, at least people who are sincere, devoted, you know, uh, pra practitioners of Christianity, um, and maybe Islam and Judaism, it's not as clear because those are smaller sample sizes, but it looks like being very involved in your local church and, you know, going multiple times a month and so forth um, generally leads to people being pretty generous, law-abiding citizens, um, more generous than the general population, at least in the United States, in terms of uh, donating money, time, even blood. Um, you know, to blood banks and things like that. Uh, they generally live longer. They generally report, at least report, <laughs> caution, report, um, more fulfillment in their life, more meaning, and so forth. Um, that's what the, the data seem to suggest from sociology and psychology. And from then these evolutionary and cognitive perspectives, you might at least think, well, look, these things we're calling religions, or things that look very much like them, appear to have been with humans for an awful long time. Um, maybe since before we, as soon as we were anatomically modern and behaviorally modern humans, we may have had these types of things. And if you believe the adaptationists, and maybe they actually did really good work for us on either an individual level or social level in terms of our fitness. And maybe that's part of why they're here. Well, if that's right, then we should be very careful about just saying, oh, and now we need to do away with them. It'd be, a, again, a, maybe a parallel would be something like, um, there's something very natural about uh, maybe uh, music and dance. They look like they've been with us a long time. Um, maybe part of the story of why they've been with us is that they helped... Um, bond societies together, groups of people, build trust, um, uh, helped us explore our bodies in new ways, which helped us interact with our environment. I don't know what the story is there, right? But we can imagine one. But then somebody who just doesn't like music and dance says, and so we don't need them anymore. And they're like, well, wait a minute. We have no idea what the consequences would be if we suddenly stop doing music and dance. We have no idea. We have no idea what the consequences would be if we suddenly told everybody, stop being religious. But even the science itself suggests that it probably wouldn't be all positive. <laughs> so we need to be careful about these types of things. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm affirming your intuitions on this, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I also think that. So, uh, uh, Dr. Barrett, just before we go, would you like to tell people what might be some of the best places on the Internet uh, for them to get in touch with you and your work? Oh, um, yeah. So I am the... Um, the chief project developer at the STAR office at Fuller, and we have a website, so that's the STAR, uh, S-T-A-R, um, office at fuller.edu. Um, you can sort of see what we're up to there. Um, but there are other teams of folks. I i don't have all of the web addresses in, in my head, but uh, there are a number of groups of, of researchers, uh, including uh, some of the people that we've named already that are, are really good resources in the cognitive science of religion. Um, there is an international association for the cognitive science of religion, the IACSR. So, you know, checking out what they're doing. Um, there And a few key journals like uh, uh, Religion, Brain, and Behavior is a great journal in the area. Journal of um, Cognition and Culture is another, and the IACSR has its own journal, the Journal for Cognitive Science of Religion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will be leaving links to all of that in the description box of the video for people to go and check them out. So, Dr. Barrett, again, it was really a pleasure to have you on the show, and I really think that it is important for us to have more of these conversations that where religion and science and religious people and atheists intersect. Because, as I said before, I think it's really unfortunate for us to have the approach that some atheists and also some fundamentalists from religion religion have j just to demonize the other side because that's really not productive. So I agree with you. Thanks for having me on. It's a real pleasure to talk to you. Hi everybody, thank you so much for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics from a variety of fields. So just to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you don't like Patreon, you can also do it via PayPal and Subscribestar. Yeah, all of the links will be in the description box. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my Patreons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelina, Jim Frank, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Jane Eninen, and my first producer, Isar Weber. Thank you for all.